In 2003, I came to live in Ceredigion on the west coast of Wales. It's a largely rural area, and I spend a lot of time walking in the countryside or simply observing the birds and insects that visit my garden. Inevitably, this has influenced my writing. I've always specialised in narrative poetry, but when I came to write my seventh collection, I wanted to concentrate on shorter, more lyrical poems, and especially ones on the theme of nature. So Wing includes poems on butterflies, birds, fish and fungi. Insects in particular fascinate me. A well-known editor once said well, they must live in fear of me, not because I, I would swap them, but that I would put them in a poem. One piece is an invocation to an earwig, based on the old wives' tale that they have a habit of calling to people's ears, a myth which gives them their name. At the heart of the book is a sequence of poems about 17th century scientist Robert Hooke and his observations through one of the early microscopes. Hooke's 1665 book Micrographia, with its beautiful illustrations, revealed to its first readers that the world was far more complex than they had suspected. The intricate, endlessly varied architecture of snowflakes, convoluted seashell no bigger than a grain of sand, the pulsing poison sack of a stinging nettle, metal as its transparent hairs pierced the skin. His writing is full of wonder at these discoveries, and inspired me to adapt it into poems of my own that tried to capture some of his personality, as well as the natural objects themselves. As this suggests, Wing is not just about nature, but about people and their culture too. I've always enjoyed exploring the richness and imaginative potential of language, and one aspect of that is the names we give to things. Some apple and rose varieties, for example, have names that like poems in themselves. Queen of Sauce, Coe's Golden Drop, and Cat's Head for the Apples. Fragrant crowd, Cloud, Fortune's Double Yellow, and Hume's Blush Tea-Scented China for the Roses. Other names celebrated in the poems are those of mushrooms, of the fireworks I remember from my childhood, and of English villages, Rhyme Intrinsica, Map Powder, Wright and Eleven Towns. Wing includes three tributes to great poets of the past. Frog, Crow, adapts the two most famous haiku of the Japanese poet Basho, the one about the frog jumping into the old pond, and the one about the crow on a leafless branch, into a theme and variations form. Clock is adapted from a medieval poem by David Ap Willem, in which he complains about having been woken from sleep by the chiming of what must have been the first clock in Wales. A Dream of Cornwall is an elegy for the Scottish poet W.S. Graham, who spent most of his life in Cornwall, as well as drawing on my own memories of Cornish holidays. Unusually, there is no title poem in the book, but it is full of images of wings and flight, most of all in free fall, an elegy for a university friend who died in a parachute accident. The poem is a meditation on falling, flying and vertigo, and it ends with a twist on the stock metaphor of death as sleep. We talk about falling asleep, and perhaps this idea is also behind the falling dreams we sometimes have. So the poem, suggest, the poem suggests that my friend, like any other dreamer, has closed his eyes and fallen from the earth. Step through the hatchway of sleep. The lurch you feel will subside in a heartbeat. You voyaged every night to these upper regions, falling from the earth with downy seeds, with the spiderlings that drift here, so much higher for them. Sleep on the wing, the way swallows are said to. Sleep on the wing. I'm going to read three poems from Wing. First is dedicated to the Welsh poet John Barney, who has devoted much of his work to the theme of nature. The title is Mere, a rather lovely old word, sometimes used for a pond, especially in the north of England. There is a mere in the centre of All Sage of the town in Cheshire, where I spent my early childhood, and this poem is partly reminiscent of that, as well as many other ponds I've known. Mere, to John Barney. Today, the mere turns a blind eye to the white overhead, but when the wind gets up, it shivers in its sequence. There is blue in the bands around the stem of the dragonfly, a few tatters of sunlight in the flowers of the yellow flag. A heron mimes a pond ornament in the shallows, as a mallard takes off from its runway of splashes. The air above the bulrushes is granular with midges. On the surface, a pond skater pilots a flotilla of dimples. The metallic swivelling of roaches is no guide. Following those arrows will get you nowhere. There's a green finer than we can see. The hydra budding its offspring. Another mere laps within the cell wall of the amoeba. 
The next poem is about the legendary hot summer of 1976, when I was 19. One of the consequences of the unusual heat of the plague of ladybirds. Ladybird Summer That summer there was a rash of ladybirds, drifting over the garden in a reddish smoke. We'd find them on the carpet, a smattering of coral beads from a broken necklace, but self-willed, crawling every which way, mating like tiddlywinks. The flowering season for insects, crickets twitched the grass, moths trundled under their paper dark wings, or crouched on the ceiling in the circle of brighter light above the lampshade, and the mosquitoes balanced on the wall on moonlander legs. Trees split in the heat. We drove through a tawny country now turned to outback. In the pub courtyard we talked till the colour drained from the petunias and the hanging baskets, unwilling to go home carrying the weight of the day's air. There was too much summer. The ladybirds that gathered on ledges to be crunched by the closing windows had lost their picture book brightness. We were glad of the first sign of autumn, a bowl of plums, frost blooming on their skin, and tart sunshine in their yellow flesh. Finally, a poem that was triggered by a reader's letter in the Notes and Queries column of the Guardian newspaper, which asked why so many spring flowers are yellow. The answer wasn't particularly interesting, but it caused me to write a poem in celebration of the profusion of yellows in spring. should add that on the coast of South Ceredigion, yellow-flowered laburnum trees have taken over the hedgerows for reasons no one is really sure of, which makes a drive down that coast on a May evening a spectacular experience. Yellow. You crack the shell and think, there is yellow in everything. It has claimed a sector of tablecloth, warms your right hand as you go prospecting with a teaspoon for liquid yellow and scrape a lump of fridge-hard butter across your bread. A few Easter cards stand on the sill with their yolk-coloured hatchlings, beside a vase of daffodils blaring through their megaphones. Not long after the first crocuses fingered through the earth, the lawn is raging with dandelions. Look at the primroses, each with a darker star at the centre, and the forsythia spraying lemon by the fence. What are they warning us about with their high-vis signage? The lane is blazoned with heraldic suns of celandines, and beacons of gorse and broom catch across the hills. Is there in the ring round the eye of a blackbird, and the first brimstone of the year, a floater at the edge of your vision, dithers like a sunflake cast by a stained glass window. A bronze thrumming in the cowslips reminds you of honey. You crack the world, and yellow runs out with the green. Next come the buttercup meadows with their millions in gold. And then, one evening in May, you'll drive down the coast with the overgrown hedgerows of laburnum on one side of you, Welsh sheep fields hung with accessories by Klimt, and a blob of yellow on the other, softening into the sea. <laughs>